Look at the 18th chapter, I just want to, um, with you, reflect for a moment on an incident that happened not far from here, not long ago, a synagogue, uh, where someone went in and, uh, and, and, and wreaked havoc. You know the story in uh, Colleyville, and you know, I'm pleased to say that that, that came to a, uh, uh, a good end without any people harmed. Uh, save for the assailant himself. I want you to know that for the longest year that we have had security, um, that uh, if, if, if someone comes in here with a mind to do harm, they'll discover it's not a safe place for them. Uh, the, the, the rabbi, the congregational leader, happens to be a police officer himself, that's me. And I happen to be the director of the police academies with the Dallas College system. In conjunction with that, or I should say beyond all that, I have over the years had a variety of opportunities to, with others, go teach workshops at pastor's conferences where churches got together to look and to assess uh, congregational security. And one of our own, I won't mention a name, went through some of that training and, and others have had a look at it as well. So uh, I, I do think it's always good to, to be to be vigilant, and uh, my understanding is that is the rabbi at that other synagogue um, did go through some training himself. In any case, uh, I want you to know that we're aware of the world that we live in. With all that said, I'd like to go back in time to the 18th chapter of uh, the book of Exodus, and this story comes just before the delivery of the luchos, the, the, the tablets, the commandments, the Decalogue. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, will come down the mountain. Uh, he's going to go up the mountain and then come down. Uh, and this is an advanced story. Uh, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, have left Egypt. And they're there. And there's an interesting reunion that takes place. You know, when Moses went off to Egypt, uh, he left his family. He was separated. And, uh, you know, he had an assignment, a rough assignment, and he left his wife and sons with his father-in-law, Yitro, commonly referred to as Jethro. And we're told in the literature here that when Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moses leaves Egypt with now this mass of Hebrews in tow, uh, his father-in-law learns of it, and he comes and meets Moses. So you have the, the family united here. He comes back with Moses' wife and sons. And so we're at that moment. And I want to pick up in chapter 18, verse 1. We're told Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law heard about everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how Adonai, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt. He goes on in verse 5, So Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now, just something here by way of observation. It's worth noting that if you look at Moshe Rabbeinu, if you look at Moses, arguably the greatest Hebrew, it's worth noting that his wife was a Midianite, not a Hebrew. Now, if you look at Midian in antiquity and place that, Midian would be today northwestern Saudi Arabia. It's interesting that, that his wife would have been what we call an Arab. Now, the term Arab in Hebrew, Arabah, harks to the dry lands. Now, there's different graded levels of desert lands. Here, we're told that Moses went into the wilderness. Wilderness, it's not desert, midbar in Hebrew. But Arabah, it's particularly noted for it's being particularly dry and sandy and what have you. And the Midianites were, were, were Bedouin. They traveled. They, they moved about. Now, right off the bat, we're told here that uh, by association, if Jethro 
Moses' father-in-law was a Midianite, then by the conventions of the day, irrespective of the origin of his mother, um, it, it, that the, the child, the daughter, uh, would have been a Midianite, an Arab woman. Now, we're not just told that in the literature. We're told that Moses' father-in-law wasn't just a Midianite, but he was a priest of Midian, which means he was something of a leading figure, a tribal head, and a religious leader on top. Now, it's very interesting when you start to look at these characters that here, if you're looking at Moses' family, it's not the pristine kind of family where, you know, I mean, here's the father of the Hebrews, the Hebrew religion, Jewish boy meets Jewish girl, and they get married. I mean, I'm of Jewish extract from both parents. My wife, Barry, is of Jewish extract from both parents. You might expect that of Moses, but no. If you look at Moses' family, it's a little different. Now, circumstances had imposed upon Moses to make it a little different. But never mind for the moment Moses' family that he married into. If you look at where Moses came from, not where he went, if you can recall the story earlier in Exodus, Moses was born in Mitzrayim in Egypt in very troubled times. His mother put him in a basket, floated down the river. He winds up floating into uh, uh, a princess in Egypt's uh, entourage. And Moses winds up getting adopted into the Egyptian royal household, a household of royals. Moses was raised. He was of Hebrew extract. And by the, word, by the way, the word Hebrew, Ibru, etymologically comes from beyond the river. That is, if you look at Abraham, Abraham wasn't a Jew. Abraham was a Hebrew, a Hebrew beyond the river. The term Jew hasn't even appeared in biblical literature yet. In fact, neither has synagogue, neither has rabbi. Whatever Moses set up, it wasn't this. Because you don't have that till centuries later in Old Testament history. In any case, looking at Moses, returning to that Moses was of Hebrew stock, to be sure. But just right at, not long after birth, he gets absorbed into an Egyptian household. He's enculturated into all of that for the better part of 40 years. It wasn't just a summer camp for Egyptian stuff. I mean, that, I mean he was every bit that. Circumstances imposed upon him, partly by his own making, and, but providentially so, Moses winds up fleeing Egypt, runs for his life to get out of Dodge, and he goes down to Midian. And uh, there, eventually, he's going to find love and marriage. But, I mean, he was a Hebrew, but, he, but it, it would be overly simplistic to say, well, he just came from a Jewish world. His world was much more complex. And certainly when you look at the world that he married into here, noted a Midianite, it gets very complex. And not only that, later on in, in the book of Numbers, Moses' sister, Miriam, takes him on because she didn't like her sister-in-law. The sister didn't like Moses' wife. Now, you know, there ain't no feud quite like a family feud. Uh, these tensions build up within the family. It's one of the reasons why it's extremely dangerous for police to respond to a domestic disturbance. Uh, because you're just as, the, the police officer who responds is just as apt to get hurt by the victim as by the perp, the perpetrator. Which is why standard policy is you're dispatched to a domestic you know, one, squ one squad car's out there in a one-car unit, and she or he is just waiting, you know, yelling and screaming and breaking glass. You don't go in. Oh, those lazy cops, they don't, they don't care. No, 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 it's just, it's the conventions of the industry. You wait for your backup goes. You at least want one backup unit. Because once you go in there, it goes mad. Because the, the, the coil, the tensions, they build up, they build up, they build up. And when they pop, those energies can go any which way, and whoever's there, God help them. 
uh, and the police can be a, a lightning rod to absorb those tensions. In any case, this family tensions. In, in Numbers chapter 12, Moses' sister Miriam is explicit. She cannot stand Moses' wife. But in that case, if you look in the first three verses of, of Numbers chapter 12, therein the literature says that, that he was mad because he married a Cushite, not a Midianite. The wife there, in fact, uh, you know, why take my word for it? Maybe I'm lying. If you will, uh, go to Numbers chapter 12. Did I say 13 earlier? I'm sorry for that. If you look in chapter 12, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. I'm looking at verse 1. On account of the Cushite woman he married, because he married a Cushite woman. Now, that's, if you look at the language there, it's superfluous. That is to say, we're told that, that, that Miriam mentioned first, and then she drags her brother into it, Aaron. Family tensions are like that. Others get drug into it. Now, the, we're told here that Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses on account of the Cushite wife he married. Period. But then it says, Miriam was mad because of the Cushite wife he married, because he married a Cushite woman. It says it twice for effect. Now, if, you wanna, if you're speaking verbally for effect and you want to accentuate something, you can raise your volume, you know, tonal inflections. There's ways uh, rhetorically to let your audience know that this is, you want to stress the point. But in the, the conventions of literary and writing where you, you, you can't hear, there's certain uh, literary conventions that stress a point, repetition being one of them. She was p ticked off because she didn't like the Cushite woman, because she didn't like the Cushite woman. It says it twice. Now, if you look at where Cush was in antiquity, and here's the issue, here's the question, here's the problem. If you look at where Cush was in antiquity, it's Ethiopia. It's not Midian. It's in Ethiopia. Midian, again, is the northwestern part of the Arabian Peninsula. If you're looking at Ethiopia or Cush, there you're looking at the eastern edge of the African continent. Now, because the, uh, uh, be, be, because, you know, the Midianites traveled, they were Bedouin in effect. Well, you know, it's the clan could have moved, spent some time there in, in Cush and then married. And, you know, it is true that the wife could have been both a, a Midianite and a Cushite. Could be that one wife died and he married again. It could have been in that world he had two wives. But in any case, one of the things that's interesting, if you look at Moses, this great Hebrew, if you consider where he came from and if you consider what he married into, it's just interesting. It's not, I mean, if this is the greatest Hebrew that ever lived, I mean, but, but if you look at who he was, he comes from a very assimilated, admixture of, of peoples, not only racially or tribally, but religiously, philosophically. He marries into a family, and the, the, the leader of the clan is, is a leader of another religion. Now, let's look at it again and pay attention. In verse 1, Jethro, the priest of Midianite, now, if I was writing the Bible, I would have hid that right off the bat. <laughs> you know, if it's, uh, you know, if it, meet, meet the in-laws, meet the family, the stuff I just wouldn't print. If you want, because Moses is going to talk against intermarriage and what have you, you know, and there's just stuff that's better left unsaid. So if I was the author of this, I would omit. But, you know, I, no one asked my opinion. We're told here, Jethro, the priest of Midian, the, Moses' father-in-law, heard about everything that God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, etc. Now, there's a point here that I really want to underscore. You're going to see later on as we read through it that, that this, this man, um, Jethro, is going to become converted. He's going to say, it's explicit in the literature. Uh, he's, if you, and you can go ahead with, we, with me in verse 10. Jethro said, in response to, to Moses sharing about what God had done 
for him and through him, etc. Jethro then said in verse 10, Blessed be Adonai, blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hands of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods since they had acted arrogantly against them. Now, what's interesting is after recounting the story, the testimony, it's in the aftermath of that, then Jethro says, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, all this and all that. It wasn't that Moses explained to him the finer points of theology. It didn't come on the heels of a dispute, of a debate about what version of the Bible to read or how to understand the biblical text. Well, there were none at the time. Anyway. But the point is, I just say that for effect. The point is, it was Moses sharing incontrovertible evidence about how the Lord had worked in and through his own life. There was someone who was close to Moses, who knew him, for inasmuch as Moses spent 40 years in an Egyptian clan before he was expunged, before he was kicked out of Egypt, he goes to Midian and he spends 40 years in Jethro's family, so you know him. So, so, so Jethro knew what this man was all about. And uh, he, he knew the story, the history. And it's not just that Moses is saying, hey, let me tell you something. There's hundreds of thousands of people. <laughs> you know, Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness leading sheep around the place. Now he's got hundreds of thousands of human sheep. And when he tells the story, particularly about being rested free from the Egyptians from Pharaoh. Now we can have a discussion about which dynasty it was. Um, that who, the question is, who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus? And they can, we can weigh that against the evidence of the strength of the respective dynasties. Some were stronger than others. But this needn't be a, a course in, his, in, in Egyptian history, Egyptology. But the point is, this man who was a, 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 a tribal leader in his own right knew of the Egyptian strength of the dynasty and what have you. And to see w what happens through Moses, in his mind, it, it's kind of like a wow moment. This is more than just, my son-in-law made good. You know, this is more than, well, praise the Lord, he got a good job. I mean, there's just kind of miracle that's mixed into the moment. Which is one of the reasons why I say, particularly uh, when we're thinking about how to uh, make the gospel look good. You know, Paul referred to the gospel as an aroma in the uh, uh, Corinthian correspondence. Second Corinthians. Now, when I wake up in the morning, I like to take a shower. I want to put on deodorant. And I have this cologne, Essence of Jerusalem, and I spray it all over the place. There's a few reasons why I put on too much cologne. One of which is that at 66, I know I'm old and that we people have a certain smell at this age. And, and I don't know if it might just happen upon me in the course of a day. So I give it a few extra squirts just in case. Uh, the other reason is, is, is that I'm not looking to attract another woman, but as a human being, I, I don't want there to be anything adverse about me. I, I would prefer to be attractive in the context of interacting with people. Now, if you look at what made Moses' story attractive, it's not the cologne that he's wearing, it's not that he's exegeting biblical texts, but it's attractive to hear about what's happening in your own life and miracles and breakthroughs in it. That's the story. And I think there's something to be said about us being in touch with our own self uh, and the moments 
uh, the things that God has done in our life, uh, the breakthrough points, and, and give voice to that. Um, because then you're not just talking about God. You know, Paul didn't just preach Christ. He, sp- he did, but he didn't just preach the gospel. He spoke of my gospel. And he spoke not just about Christ, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is to say, how does the Jesus story intersect with your own experience? And where are there breakthroughs there? Where's the testimony? Now, you've got to hear me on this. Before you're going to get a testimony, you're going to have to get a test. Sometimes people in life get broken down before they get built back up again. You know, we know Moses is the great, uh, as the great leader, lawgiver, but he was broken down 40 years in a wilderness in the backwaters until God called him back into it. Well, this King David, he's, he's great. He had to get broken down too. I mean, the prophet came and put oil on him and said, you're anointed to be king. That's great. He spent the next 13 years running from Saul. It's not like, presto, you got the religion, the famous prayer, and all of a sudden it all takes off. I mean, all these people go into the school of hard knocks. You take Paul. You know, you know, Paul comes to faith in Jesus, and uh, I mean, he's got a man with a message and a ministry. Paul leaves the greatest mark in the New Testament of any author, to be sure. If you just look at the, the, the volume of literature, Paul, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and then he writes individuals, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, and Philemon. There's 13 books there, the Pauline Corpus. I mean, he's, he's the greatest writer, the greatest theologian in the New Testament. Interestingly, he didn't know Jesus personally, never drank any water, turned to wine. He wasn't part of the original group. He comes in later. It's interesting. But what's interesting to me as well, if you look at Paul's career, Paul accepts Jesus. He goes and spends three years in the wilderness. If, if, you look at the, if you look at Paul's testimony in Acts and compare it to the beginning of Galatians and reconstruct his experience, Paul is smitten, he turns up blind, he gets a miracle breakthrough in his own life where his sight is restored, and then he spends three years in the backwaters of the wilderness somewhere. He doesn't go to Jerusalem, save for two weeks after three years, and then he goes back to Tarsus in Cilicia, which is... Eastern Turkey today, and he goes there for 10 years in the backwaters. We know nothing about him. There's another 13 years there, three years in the wilderness of Damascus, 10 years in obscurity and nothingness. Finally, later, he's going to emerge. I mean, if, if, if you look at people that were really winners in biblical literature, they were losers before they were winners. And the net result is that if you look at the way it comes together, they have a certain testimony. Someone can say, wow, I can see how the Lord has worked in this circumstance. It doesn't mean life is perfect, but it's nice to be able to testify what God has done. That, that, that telegraphs something to people. My lovely wife, Barry, who, who, who led music, I was married for 30 years. Um, you know, before him, my first wife, may she rest in peace, died of ovarian cancer. And, and Barry and I married. Barry never married. She was 62 when we married, and uh, she lived life alone. And, and, and uh, so when, when she shares her testimony, it gives women hope who find themselves either it seems like life has gone on too long without finding love, or something happened where they were disconnected in life through death or divorcement, and they find themselves alone. And to, and. The, the story of a woman who finds love later in life. The testimony itself, it, just, the, just the story itself is better than just a sermon on trusting God for your life. You can preach the story, seek first his kingdom and everything else will be yours and the saints will say amen. But it's nice to see living examples of how that actually works out. And I said all that to say this, that's what we're seeing here. What, 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 what really facilitates uh, this transaction, this conversion of Jethro? And again, if you look, please, uh, he says now in verse 
11, I know that God is greater than all the gods. Now, he served one of them. He was a priest in Midian. And maybe the Midianites had a few. But there's a sense, and there's a wow movement where this guy uh, sees something that, 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 that's, that's transacted historically in the life of his son-in-law. Now, he's a neophyte. He's brand new. He learns something uh, from God at work in Moses and becomes converted. What's interesting is right after that, Moses learns something from him. And, and, and I, I really want you to pay attention to this, please. Uh, not pay attention to me. There, there's something I believe that is significant in the story. Uh, this chapter is going to end in a few verses with Jethro going away, kind of fading off into the pages of biblical history. He makes his entrance in verse 1 and fades away in short order. There's two stories here. Number one is uh, his uh, giving uh, acknowledgement of what God had done historically and becoming converted in the process. The second thing that's noted here is this transaction where Jethro finds something wrong with Moses, and he tells him. And I'll tell you something about family, too. Family will, will tell you what they think. You know, for me, I'm really guarded about that. I do not like unsolicited advice. I tell people, if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. I, I, I just don't, um, you know, I, I just don't like... Well, you know, can I tell you what I think? No. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, it sounds a little snotty, but sometimes people get into other people's business too much. And for me, I'm the kind of person, I like a little space. But it doesn't matter whether you like it or not with family, they're going to tell you what they think. It's just one of the rights, one of the prerogatives of being in the family. We already saw this later on in in Numbers, just, just, just Miriam, his sister, and Miriam wasn't just his sister, she was his big sister. And it wasn't just that she was his big sister, but she was a quasi-mother to Moses when he was growing up. So she kind of figured, he's mine, I own him. And uh, because what happens is Moses in the basket floats into this princess's world and Oh, cute baby. And, 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 and Moses' big sister was following on the shore. And she says, hey, look, lady, do you want someone to nurse the kid? And Miriam arranges for Moses' birth mother to get a job nursing him. So she's getting paid to raise the kid, who is now raised as a prince in Egypt because of Miriam. So Miriam says, well, this kid's mine for life. You know, he owes me. And big sisters are like that. If you're going to have a big family, you know, last week, Barry and I, uh, on Sunday, had dinner with some friends, Ten, 11 kids, 11 kids. If you're going to have a big family, that's great, but you better pray to God the first one and two were girls. You pray to God, you get the girls on the front end, because the girls will help. They'll be like quasi-moms to, to the little ones. And, and it, it, it just kind of happens that way. Well, here's Mary and this big sister saying, look, I don't like this wife of yours. I don't recall Moses saying, hey, Mary, what do you think about my wife? But they just say it. Well, here, I want you to see where the father-in-law just, he speaks to Moses. And he sees a problem and he corrects him. His father-in-law. A lot of people have problems with in-laws because in-laws talk. My mother-in-law said, hey, do you, do you mind if I come over for Thanksgiving? I said, no, just hop on your broom and fly down. That's, that's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. But, but the point is, is there can be tensions. Now look at this. In verse 13, the next day, Moses sat to judge the people, and they stood around Moses from morning till evening. You know, Moses is a mocker. He's a big shot. He kind of leads the enterprise, and people are needing to talk to him. Now, when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, what's this you're doing to the people? Why sit by yourself alone with all the people standing around you from morning to evening? What are you doing? You're killing these people, Mo. 
and it's so inefficient. Moses says in verse 15, well, you know, the people come to me, they, they have questions, and you know, I got to do it. In verse 17, Moses' father-in-law said, what you're doing is no good. Hey, look stupid, wake up and smell the coffee. You will surely wear yourself out as well as these people who are with you because the task is too heavy for you. Now, if you're the principal judge, if you look at the size of this population, if you take the literature literally, the book of Numbers, so-called, it's referred to as Bamid Bar in Hebrew, in the wilderness, but Numbers, it's named after that in the Greek translation from which we get it because there's a numbering of the men of fighting age that left Egypt in the Exodus. And you add it all up, there's over 600,000. Now, if those are the men of fighting age, and you figure women of proximate age, and if you figure children that are too young to be of fighting age and people that are too old, if you wanted to aggregate that with a reasonable guesstimate, you're looking at a population of some two million people. The point is, then, if, if Moses is set up as, you know, judging, I got to do this and I got to do that, and everyone is standing around, and this is what he's doing. And this is what people are used to. Here's a story, someone who's an outsider with a different set of eyes looks at it and sees a problem that everyone else was just used to living in. I mention that because, I want you to hear me on this, all of us have blind spots in our thinking. We all have weaknesses. In all aspects of our life, the way we're thinking, the way that we're interacting, the things that we're doing, we all have weaknesses blind spots. That's why it's good sometimes to be open to counsel from someone who can present to the task with a fresh set of eyes. A fresh set of eyes. Now, people aren't usually interested in counsel. They're not. Moses could have said, who are you? God's done all this through me. I'm the man. You know, I've gotten this far without you, Dad. And uh, who are you anyways? You know, Besides, you just got saved yesterday. Now you're telling me how to leave God's people today. You know, it, it, it's, I mean, there, there, there's ways someone could have bowed up and taken umbrage, taken offense at that. I want to underscore, it really is hard for people to listen to people. In fact, all things being equal, just in the course of conversing with human beings... Do you know that the average person will check out of a conversation? You're talking to them. They will check out of a conversation internally six to ten times per minute. Thinking about this and that, drifting. People are there, you know, with a perfunctory presence, but intellectually, emotionally, they weave, they weave in and out. Listen, I, I try and be a reasonably responsible exegete of biblical literature. I try and be an interesting person. But I know people will weave in and out. But if you just look at it conversationally, people will take leave briefly six to ten times per minute. If you look at speech, people only hear half of what you say when you say it. People only hear half of it. Yes. <laughs> well, speak of repeating it. Do you know that those that do hear it, only 12 to 24 percent of people will remember what they heard 48 hours later? You can hear a good joke, and I always say this that's the funniest thing in the world. You laughed and laughed and laughed, and you completely forgot about it. Uh, you know, 60 seconds later, and God help you, you can't remember what it was. That now, if you look at hearing, hearing comes replete with its own problems, which is why, and I've said this as a professor, why a dull pencil is better than a sharp brain. That, uh, you know, developing the aptitude to listen, to write, to take a note, that there's more of one's person that's involved in learning rather than just being a passive uh, receiver. You know, the more someone's engaged in this muscle, you know, this movement, this processing, this thinking, and the more that someone's engaged in the enterprise, the more apt they are to remember it, or the greater the possibility. In any case, 
let it just be said that people have a problem with hearing. People have a problem with getting advice, with receiving advice. Here, Jethro says, what you're doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out as well as these people who are with you because the task is too heavy for you. Last night, I uh, uh, had a graduation. I had two cadet classes uh, graduate from the Dallas College Law Enforcement Academy. And um, so, you know, it, it's commencement. They, they've been through one tough, the rigors of a police academy, families that are celebrate. You know, they've been so checked out just to focus on that. You know, then the families, it affects the whole family. And so, you know, and there's different chiefs of police there that are pinning badges on the graduates who had provisional um, job offers predicated upon graduating the academy and passing the state TECOL exam, the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Education. So, the, so they had graduated the academy and passed TECOL. One didn't pass the TECOL exam, but he still graduated the academy. He was there. So there's a lot of fanfare. Families there. They're celebrating a major moment, a milestone, a major accomplishment. Uh, the vice provost of the, of the college's school of law and public services there. A uh, number of instructors are there, family, friends. And my, uh, one of my employees uh, was assigned the task of doing the welcome. Because there's different people who put together a, like an order of service, you know. And so it was just her task to do the welcome. And she gave a little bit of a welcome talk. Well, I noticed she looked terrible. I wouldn't tell a woman, you know, you look terrible. It wasn't terrible in the sense of ugly. It was terrible in the sense something didn't look right. And then, you know, I heard some speech slurred a little bit at the end. Now, I thought, uh, and I like to give people opportunities to do things that otherwise wouldn't be there. Me, the director, Dr. Seif, you know, I can exercise my prerogatives and grab the mic and welcome, blah, blah, blah. But you know, I like to give different people opportunities to do different things. But they're not as experienced behind a microphone. So I attribute it, the problem, to just a little bit of stage fright that she's pressing through. She finished her talk, and then she was, you know, I could see from where I was sitting, she was just looked like holding on. Or I thought something, she had some buttons here, got snagged. She was stuck there, kind of like catatonic for a second. And then she collapsed backwards. Um, and of course, you want to make the moment about those that are graduating, those that have come. But she collapsed, fell backward. And uh, of course, is the crowd that rushes, a lot of first responders, you know, paramedics and what have you. She's taken out. And, and uh, the question was, did she have a stroke? And there, was, there were reasons to think that, that, that she did. After the um, commencement service, you know, we kind of regrouped and, and, and pushed a reset. After that, then we, um, you know, she was taken to the hospital, Baylor downtown. So, you know, I left when, you know, when we got through everything and uh, I didn't stay for the festivities afterwards. I just did my job as the principal master of ceremonies and I just went. I took leave. Uh, to go check on her. It turns out she didn't have a stroke, thank God. She was just very dehydrated. She didn't take care of herself. She didn't drink. She felt under pressure. She, uh, um, and, and she didn't take care of herself. I remember um, a couple of years ago, I went and run, ran White Rock Lake, nine point some miles. It was summertime, and I collapsed afterward just because I didn't drink. You know, I wasn't, high, wasn't taking care of myself. And uh, in any case, if you don't take care of yourself, you collapse. Here, um, you know, in verse 18, chapter 18, verse 18, what you're doing is not good. You're going to wear yourself out. And you're going to wear these people out having to wait for you sun up to sundown. You can't do this alone by yourself. If you look at verse 21, he says, but you should seek out capable men out of the people, men who fear God, men of truth, who hate bribery. Now, if you want to see God at work in your life, 
you know, we all want God to show up. We'll go to such and such church. Reverend so-and-so has got that blessing hand of prayer and can just, you know, infuse blessing. Listen, if you want God to show up, you don't need my magic hand or my withered hand. Maybe there's certain ways that we live that lend themselves to success in life that wouldn't otherwise be there. And maybe success in life has a lot more to do with you than what church you happen to sit in. He says here, if you look at these capable people that, 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 that they can have a role in this new economy, individuals who fear God, uh, who, who reverence God, Ya'ar Adonai, he speaks of reverence, people who love truth. Emet in Hebrew, the word for truth, is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the middle letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You know, you want things to, to line up perfectly. Did you ever interact with people where there seems to be some incongruity between what they say and what reality really is? You, you, you want there to be truth in your inter interactions with people. If you suspect that something's amiss, you're going to shut down. I told Barry uh, yesterday, we had lunch. We met for lunch, and I said, look, I, I got a... a, a uh, uh, I got a, a phone message. I don't know about you. I don't pick up the phone if, if I don't recognize a phone number. Let it go to voicemail, and I'll decide if I want to deal with it. Just because someone wants to talk to me doesn't mean I want to talk to them. That's why God created voicemail. Well, I, you know, I, 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 I looked at the voicemail, and it said, this is Bank of America, and we're kind of following up on a situation. So I called him up because I'd filed a claim a week prior, yeah, just like eight days prior, because I, I looked at my statement and I thought, wait a minute, there's expenses here. This doesn't look right. This doesn't look right. Now, I'd, 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 I'd observed when I'd look at my, you know, when I'd look at, I'd, when I go through things every month, I saw expenses there you know, a bill for $4,000 here, 5000 I thought, well, uh, but I, I've been paying tuition at Cambridge University, and there's expenses, and I figured, well, I guess that's the credit card, you know, because, you know, I have to fly to England, you know, every couple of months and stay there for a month, and, you know, it, it's so, so I knew that there were heftier expenses. So when I saw these things in, in the course of a year, I just figured it's the Cambridge stuff. But I was a little confused because I thought, wait a minute, I thought that I, I paid that. And, and then plus, there was one bill that came for $6,000, you know, uh, in November. And I thought, well, I thought, well, I thought I paid this thing in September, and that should have been taken care of in October. And, uh, and then, you know, why, is, why am I seeing it again, this Cambridge bill? And then there was another one for $6,000 plus dollars. When I aggregated it up, there were $34,000 of expenses. That, that, that I couldn't account for. And so I contacted Bank of America and I, I, I filed fraud. Um, and so Bank of America sent me something a couple days later. Of course, this is a hefty amount. Uh, and, and they said they, they, they released $34,000 back to me in theory, but then they followed up and said they've confirmed 12,000 of that. So when I get a phone call from Bank of America, uh, this is so-and-so from Bank of America, we're just following up. I assumed it was the same. I, I assumed they were following up on the fraud claim that I just filed. But then when I called, the woman said, well, you know, this is the bank, and, you know, it was just a payment that, that was turned back to the bank for $6,000, it was the people that were scamming me that, 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 that tried to hit the bank again for another six grand and it got turned back. So they called me ostensibly representing the Bank of America, but I realized it didn't line up. And so what I did is I hung up right away and I called Bank of America and processed it with them. And do you know this phone number? No. Did you contact me? No. Listen, and let's get rid of this credit card and whatever that they were referring to. Just get rid of it all and push a reset. Because I sensed that just in, in talking, even, even though it looked kind of right where um, someone 
from the Bank of America's contacting me, though it looked kind of right. It, uh, but when I got into the conversation, I realized, wait a minute, something's amiss here. And when you realize something amiss, when it doesn't all line up, you're going to shut down. Now, that's a gross example. You know, my, my story here, and I'm finishing up in short order. My, my story here was people want to hear about how God is at work in your life so people can get diverted. Not hear how the devil's at work in your life. But it's the best I can do this week. <laughs> best I can do. I'd love to tell you what God is up to, but now I can only give you the devil. I'm sorry. Come back next week. I'll do a little better. I had a conversation with a woman uh, this week who was taking a, uh, a class on homiletics, public speaking, uh, in seminary, and she was tasked with uh, interviewing someone. And she had observed, she said, you know, I noticed that when you, when you minister the word, I try and stay close to the word, but... I, I, I talk about myself a lot, and it's not like I'm using you for therapy, where I feel so much better when I get it off. You know, that, 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 uh, and some people do that. I'm glad we could come and help you tonight, Jeffrey. I mean, the reality is it's supposed to be helpful toward you. But there is value in sharing a part of your own life if, it, if it's congruent with the message, if it contributes to the biblical text, to what God is all about. That's where you share your testimony. In any case... Um, here, we're looking for people in verse 21, and I'm about to finish up. We're, we're, Moses is instructed to seek out people who fear God, who are reverent toward God. Do you know, by the way, that it used to be in all 50 states that if someone was not willing to, 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 to swear on a Bible that their testimony was not to be received in court. Now it's, it's you have by oath or affirmation. I mean, the tradition was to put your hand in the Bible, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. But now it's just to affirm by a higher power, wherever it is. Uh, but, but because it was thought that if someone isn't willing, you know, that, that if you're going to, you know, swear to God on a Bible, you're going to bring damnation on yourself if you're lying. Uh, people that don't fear God... Uh, are not trustworthy. Uh, here, individuals that are reverential toward God, that leads toward success in life. You wouldn't come to a house of worship. You wouldn't come to a place like this on a Friday if you like the Messianic Jewish or on a Sunday if a regular garden variety. You don't want to be committed to that just because I like the preacher, I like the programs. You want to do it as an extension because you believe in God. And it has something to do with, I believe God wants me to do this. He wants me to do it here. Uh, but that reverence toward God pays dividends, number one. If you want things that will pay dividends in your life in the long run, be reverential toward Lord, to the Lord. Be men of truth. I think there should be congruity between what we say and who we are. That's extremely important. You know, boy meets girl, and there's fantasy. Oh, my God, she's this and she's that. There's fantasy. Okay, there's fantasy. But then after 10 years, there's history. And sometimes there's a difference between history and fantasy. Fantasy's a whole lot better. Because people notice, well, wait a minute. I didn't know this about her or this about him or whatever. And there's this incongruity. Oh, my God, I didn't know. Because what happens is when boy's interested in girl, girl's interested in boy, everyone puts their best foot forward. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. So people are deceitful. You know, they kind of represent themselves in ways designed just to secure the affection of the other person and the interest. So people are kind of maneuver and jockey. I think it's extremely important, especially for people that are courting, to really be authentic about who they are, best they know at the time, best they know to do. Because when you're with someone, what you're all about is going to come out anyway. And, and it's important for there to be congruity, emet, between, you know, that it lines up. Someone can say, well, you know, that Saif guy, he's, he's confusing. He doesn't know whether he's a Jew or a Christian, a rabbi, a reverend, a police officer, a professor, a pastor, my God, a comedian. He doesn't know who he is. That, that, uh, well, maybe there's a little bit of confusion, but I'm consistent with it. You know, it's a little weird, but there's a way, a kind of sort of way that it's balanced because the same guy that's here behind the podium, it's the same kind of guy that's going to be with you when I'm talking to you. I don't have a professional persona 
here is the man of God, and then I'm something else in reality. I, 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 I think there has to be emet, truth, balance, congruity. And I think I would commend you that pays dividends. Lastly, it pays dividends to hate bribery. You know, there's, there's an old saying, few men have the uh, integrity to, re to resist the highest bidder. You know, you know, people have a, uh, um, a place where they default and cheat and steal and they, they take it. I've seen it. I've seen police officers fall. But I mean, I've had, you know, working deep nights on the side of the road. You pull someone over. It's late at night. You know, the, the, the bars, the, the strip joints close down. And, you know, you pull someone over for speeding. And she wants to know if there's a way to, to, to settle this problem without having to get the citation. You know, you could read between the lines what, what she's wanting to know of is a little quid pro quo, a little this for that. Now, that's not good church talk, but I'm saying people do it. You know, that, that uh, and I've had opportunity, you know, look uh, here, you know, to slip me some money, a perk, a benefit. It doesn't not happen. Um, but, but you don't want to be, especially if you're a judge, you don't want to be, or any human being, you don't want to be, you don't want to succumb to bidders that are trying to lure you through deceit. In any case, lastly, and I know it's the third time I've said lastly, so it better be last in very short order. If you look in verse 24, we're told, what's that? You only hear half of it anyway, right? Yeah. I was a guest speaker at a church a couple weeks ago. I said, you know, how long do you want me to preach? The senior pastor said, look, you can preach as long as you want. We're leaving at 1210. <laughs> you know, but enjoy yourself. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to get in the way of your style there, brother, you know. <laughs> you know, any man can maybe listen to a message for half an hour or 40 minutes, but after that, it better be God. Um, if you look in verse 24, Moses listened to his father-in-law, did everything that he said. Uh, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for being with me. But I hope it's not being with me. I, I hope it's being with uh, Exodus chapter 18. I hope that, that you have more perspective than you might, know that you might have had. Uh, maybe learning some new things, maybe some things by way of reminder. But may the Lord bless the ministry of the word. Dr. Axel, if you'll come and finish up, please. Thank you very much.